let's go ahead and get started. So with chapter three, what we're just talking about is energy production. Now, you guys are familiar with this because we've gone through an exercise physiology. You had this in your other physiology classes. So the basics of, yeah, we need energy so we can do things. And specifically, when we talk about it from the exercise science, we're talking about it from actually breaking down food stuff for energy, how we create it. And that's going to be capturing energy from breaking bonds, how we store it, fat, and then obviously it's glycogen, and how we're going to regulate it, negative feedback. So the good old using energy for muscle contraction. So remember, once we get that calcium to bind to troponin, it's going to move tropomyosin off of those active sites. And then we're going to actually remember use ATP to get myosin to let go of actin and for it to recoil. So obviously our fast fibers are going to be far more glycolytic and anaerobic than our slow twitch fibers. And we're going to naturally have to chew through a lot more energy when we're going at those higher rates, just the nature of the beast. So if everything is standardized to our slow fibers, we can see how your type 2A and 2X have markedly lower amount of capillaries, mitochondria, Myoglobin trimmer delivers oxygen from the sarcoplasm to the mitochondria. Now notice way higher phosphorylase activity. So we're literally able to break down energy faster at the myosin. Phosphofructokinase levels, remember it's gonna be that third enzyme of, of glycolysis is gonna be way higher. We're going to have lower citrate synthase, which is gonna be along with succinate and dehydrogenase, which are two enzymes that are very important in the citric acid cycle along with notice the glycogen levels are actually going to be higher because we're using that anaerobically along with lower fat stores and higher phosphocreatine content, AKA we're talking about the creatine that we're going to use whenever we're using the ATP PCR. So remember our wonderful flow chart from exercise phys, just a little bit fancier of how we're going to be breaking down carbs into basic one that we use for energy in the body, which can be both glucose and the storage form being glycogen, goes through glycolysis. We got pyruvate or lactate, depending on what's going on with aerobic conditions. Then we go into acetyl-CoA and then boom, we can go through citric acid cycle. Now pyruvate is also important for conversion to the oxyl acetate so we can maintain the citric acid cycle. So that is something where carbs are burnt or sorry, fat is burned in the fires of carbohydrate. You do need a little bit of it. Now, obviously with fatty acids and that glycerol, well, glycerol can be converted into either glucose or pyruvate. That's why I see the arrow here. Fatty acids, we're only going through beta oxidation. And that's where we're going to have that being converted into acetyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA. And that in turn is going to go through the citric acid cycle. And then amino acids is a wild time because we can convert in in a lot of different ways. But we're not going to go too far down that rabbit hole. The key is just understand it's an option. You're only really using protein as a fuel source if you're really, really starving yourself out or you're in some other type of really weird situations, it's really going to be that big of a contributing factor for energy production in the body. So we like to use carbs for anything that tends to be awesome. So if it's lasting more than two or three seconds and less than three, four hours, you're probably doing it mostly on carbohydrate metabolism if it's done with real, any real intensity. So we're going to obviously utilize the glycogen stored in our muscles, that that's floating around in our bloodstream, and we're going to be liberating some from our liver if we go far enough. Now, obviously, if we break this down aerobically, we can go into the citric acid cycle along with the electron transport chain. Sorry, Norbert came over to say hello. So I'm currently doing a, a great job of multitasking. Oh, you found out where that orange slice fell. If only you would pay attention earlier, buddy. Now, you guys can see the ATP synthesis. Remember, we're getting a lot more from glycolysis whenever we're going to be doing that aerobically. Remember, if we're doing it anaerobically, we're only getting that two. Because remember, it's the activation energy of two, we are going to gross four, which means we're only gonna net two. Whereas obviously when we go through the entire, we're gonna get a lot more. And so the actual breakdown through glycolysis is gonna look like so. I'm not gonna have you guys memorize it, but do understand hexokinase is that first step that's gonna convert glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. That's important, so glucose does not leave the cell. And once it's there, it's going to stay in and either converted into glucose 1-phosphate, which then is going to go into glycogen for storage. But if we're talking exercise, we're going down. Now, this is just the three different stages of activation, cleavage, and substrate level phosphorylation, where we're going to go through and then have that pyruvate where we go to lactate and it's out, or we're going into acetyl-CoA where we're going to go ahead and undergo the rest of the joys of the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain, the carbohydrate. Now with fat, we're talking about breaking 
down those triglycerides, so the three fatty acids with the one glycerol, and those are going to be taken up into the muscle and utilized in the mitochondria for beta oxidation. Now, this is a process that requires a bit more oxygen, but is yielding way, way higher amounts of energy per gram of mass, which is great because it's very energy dense. It's just obviously problematic because it's pretty expensive to go ahead and effectively get that oxygen there, hence why we switch away from it whenever we go to higher intensities. Now we have inside of our fat cells a hormone known as, or sorry, not hormone, but an enzyme known as hormone sensitive lipase. Now this is going to be downregulated by insulin. So if we have a lot of insulin in the system, we're not going to be breaking down triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids and having to be broken down. However, if we have our stress hormones, if we have glucagon, if we have low blood sugar, if we have cortisol or growth hormone, it is actually going to help break down those triglycerides so that we are going to in turn get more fatty acids and glycerol into the bloodstream. So we're going to utilize that for energy. Now, once that fatty acid goes into our cell, it is going to be bound up to uh, through acetyl-CoA synthase into an acetyl-CoA and then in turn be bound up to carnitine and through the cat one and cat two transporters, it's going to go into the cell. And this is where you see carnitine being put into energy drinks and otherwise an idea that's going to help a little bit of fat metabolism. The research out there really doesn't show it that much, but it is something to keep in mind that might potentially pan out a little bit more, but the research isn't fully there. But either way, this is how we get the fatty acids into the mitochondria in the first place in order so we can go ahead and break it down for energy. So if we're gonna think of it as the cytosol, the sarcoplasm of the cell compared to the mitochondria, we are getting all of our anaerobic energy systems, remember guys, are gonna be happening in the cytosol, everything aerobic, and so the citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain, and beta oxidation are all in occurring in the mitochondria. Now, the citric acid cycle, I'm not going to ask you guys to memorize it. I once again think that's a tedious thing. Instead, we need to understand a couple facts. First and foremost, we're generating a lot of NADH, 1 FADH2, a GTP, which then immediately is converted into ATP, which is hilarious. Is this figure is wrong? The arrow should be flipped right here. And this arrow should also be flipped, but that's okay. They're only writing books used in academic settings to help educate people. They don't need to be accurate. Um, but hey, they, if that's the only mistake they made, they're doing pretty good. Actually, there's a couple other, but I'm not trying to throw stones. This is actually where we're producing carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is actually a byproduct of the breakdown of these nutrients. Oxygen is going to be that final electron acceptor. And that's why fats are going to essentially produce a greater or need a greater amount of oxygen because we're also generating a lot more NADH. So that means oxygen needs to be that final electron trans, uh, acceptor. So after we go ahead and generate all this, that's when we're going to go into the electron transport chain. We're going to create this wonderful gradient because we've pumped all these protons in there. And then we're going to go ahead and capture it on the backside. So yeehaw, energy production, quick review. You guys have seen this all before. If anything there was like, wait, what? Then go ahead, go back to it, read through. And if you have questions, like I said, we can always review. Now, what can we tell you? Well, when it comes to our ability to regenerate ATP and the speed, we can do it very rapidly, but the ability to keep it up for a long period of time is not great. So this right here is looking at the ATP resynthesis rate. Notice we're going close to 2.5 millimoles per kilogram wet weight per second. And that's going to be for the ATP PCR. Now we're going into more anaerobic glycolysis and see how it ramps up a little bit slower, but we're only sitting at about 1.2, so still relatively low. But then when we look at aerobic glycolysis and beta oxidation, it's even lower still. Hey, what's up, Tinks? Now, we're going to be using, remember, glucose and fatty acids taken in from the bloodstream. They can be supplied more glucose from breaking down glycogen in our liver, along with breaking down triglycerides from our fat cells. We're going to be breaking down potentially some of the amino acids in our muscle cells, but definitely ATP, obviously, that's energy currency, phosphocreatine, the glycogen, and the stored intramuscular triglyceride stores all of which are going to be used. The key is which energy system are we emphasizing and which fibers, thanks to what you are asking them to do. So this means effectively is we're going to have two different reasons that we're fatiguing out from our training. One is going to be from super high intensity work. The other is going to be for super long intensity work. So looking at the tables that we have here, guys, what do you think is the major cause of fatigue from super high intensity work? Why is it that we can't keep up that work output?
I think I put everybody to sleep. Okay, enough time. What do you mean by that, Alex? Don't you need like a, a certain amount of time for like those uh, stores to actually like go back to how they are? Okay, so you're right. We exhaust that amount. So not having a big enough store is a good way to think of it in the acute. Also, we can't resynthesize it fast enough to keep up that work output. Does that make sense? So I like your approach, but stores, we've got huge stores. It's called fat. Like I'm being very gentle with myself right now and saying I'm relatively lean for a guy my size. And I have enough calories built into my body and body fat that I could probably walk to the Atlantic Ocean and be totally freaking shredded by the time I got there on just body fat. Now, at the same time, it's more of we can't replenish it fast enough to keep up those work outputs. The other thing is what, is there any byproducts guys from aerobic, or sorry, from uh, the ATP PCR system? Are there any byproducts that we're generating from that? Norm, so are there any byproducts from ATP PCR metabolism? Is there? What do you think, buddy? Hey, no worries, Chris, no worries. Now, remember, guys, with ATP PCR, there is no byproducts. Remember, we just give that phosphate from creatine on over. With anaerobic glycolysis, that's where you guys are absolutely accurate in that we have the lactate generated, which comes with a proton with it. And remember, if the pH gets to be low enough, then literally we shut down glycolysis and we also start to shut down our ability to contract our muscles. And so we don't literally have enough energy and or the ability to regenerate it until we clear it. Yes, Norbinator, yes. So when we're talking about prolonged, now we're talking about we've just depleted our glycogen, which is really saying something and potentially really eaten into our storage of intramuscular fatty acid, uh, fatty acids. And because of that, same thing, we're gonna have a decrease in performance. So when we're looking up here, notice we only have certain rates that we can break down ATP for each of these different energy systems. And since we can only chew through and produce energy at these rates, obviously once you've gone through phosphocreatine and then glycolysis, look at how much lower the energy production is per kilogram wet weight uh, per second. And then especially when we're talking about using blood glucose and then even more so when you gotta switch over to beta oxidation. It's just a lot, lot lower of an energy production. So, and obviously what we're gonna find is over a longer period of time, we're going to first really start decreasing our muscle glycogen levels. Now this is doing more kind of steady state work, which eventually is gonna eat into our plasma glucose level. So if we could also see your liver glycogen levels, the graphs would probably look somewhat similar. And that's why we essentially see this dropping off because your liver glycogen is probably gonna be relatively exhausted. And then we're going to see an increase in the plasma fatty acids because those in this example are going to be made available so the body can utilize them also as a fuel to keep up work output. Now, how hard you're exercising is going to be highly related to how quickly you're gonna be going through that glycogen. So notice if you're going at 90 to Fruit Loops, 120% of your VO max, notice it's intermittent, so this is gonna be sprint repeats. You're gonna chew through your glycogen, notice this is grams per kilogram of muscle wet weight, really, really quickly, okay? Notice in 15 minutes, you've literally managed to burn through two thirds of it. Whereas it took you effectively what would have been 60 minutes and only 75% of your VO2 max because now we can utilize more carbs aerobically. And then when we're looking at only 30% of your VO2 max, so this is just gonna be walking for a lot of you guys. We're gonna be able to keep up that for incredibly long periods of time. And once this glycogen is depleted, yeah, we're done training and that's fine. And if your goal is to lose weight, then great. You put yourself in a deficit, your body's gonna be breaking down things so you can replenish. Great, good to go. 
what's the problem if we're working with an athlete and we just brought their glycogen levels down to this point and they've got to practice later on that day or they've got a game the next day. Bingo. So, and when they're fatigued, they're fatigued more from a lack of glycogen. And the interesting thing about glycogen is it's don't think of it like a fuel tank perfectly when we have this example here. Remember guys, glycogen has multiple branches that goes through. And so if we've got more branches that we can take and break down independently, we can have literally four different enzymes cleaving off one glucose at a time. Whereas if we're down to only two branches and we will rock out tonight, we're going to only be able to break them down even slower. And then if we only have one, even slower still. And that's the thing is we keep breaking it down, we're gonna lose those one six linkages and we're gonna lose the branching. And because of that, we're not gonna actually be able to break it down as rapidly. So as you'd expect, if you're working out at a higher intensity, you're going to go ahead and be trying to take up glucose at a far faster rate than if you were exercising at a slower rate. Now, one thing to keep in mind, we're looking at this carbohydrate depletion guys, is keep in mind the time, okay? So for how many of you guys is it relevant to know about how your body's gonna respond for four hours of exercise? So like last week, uh, Haley uh, big timed me when I saw her at the gym. How long did you play basketball for in her workout that day? Uh, that was an accident. <laughs> And I think I was there for about three hours. Three hours. Now, were you working out hard the entire time? I was just pretty much shooting and then the last hour just played pickup games. Okay. So probably the last hour was a higher intensity. Yeah. Yeah. So you're probably still, if we're going back here, notice you're going to probably be sitting, and now mine is just only 120 minutes, but you're probably hanging out here or lower if you're just shooting around because you're an in-shape person and walking around a basketball court isn't really challenging. So we're not too worried about you being depleted of glycogen. Uh, John, when you were playing volleyball, how long do you guys practice for? Usually about two hours. How high, how high intensity is those two hours? It varies. It's not super intensive right now, but. So still, let's be honest, most of volleyball is kind of standing around. Tori, no offense. Aside from doing bullpen, is playing softball really that stressful? Aside from how to say coaches and then obviously game situations? Uh, definitely not. Yeah. So, and then same thing with, you know, I can pick on uh, Alex with uh, baseball as well. But now, Kristen, what was a normal duration of hiking day when you did the AT? About every wake, uh, daylight hour, so like 8 a.m. till 6 p.m., but I had snack breaks. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, you're definitely going to use snacks breaks, bathroom breaks, and you also, you know, you got to hike out, get water and everything else, but how many miles would you typically try to cover in a day? Like 30. And that's up and down mountain. Mountain, rain, yeah. Right? Yeah, so that's where the glycogen strategies and the fueling strategies are a lot more important because even though you're working out at that low of intent, not low being relative, of course, but you're at that low enough intensity that you can sustain it for that many hours per day, but it's still 30 freaking miles. And so like anything else, that's why we're gonna really care about the carbohydrate intake we give somebody. And so depending on the intensity, we're gonna get an idea of what type of fuel source you're gonna use preferentially, along with we're going to get an idea of effectively how you're going to shift. So if we're gonna start here in this upper left column, you're gonna see when we have people maintaining that exercise output, initially the lion's share of the energy is being made from breaking down carbohydrates. However, as the, and mostly from the muscle glycogen and then a little bit from the plasma glucose, but as time shifts, notice we're consistently relying less and less on muscle glycogen mostly because it's being depleted. We're going to need to use more and more fat to maintain the output. And then finally, we're gonna see a rise and then slight fall of plasma glucose because that also is starting to become exhausted. And if any of you guys have never heard of hitting the wall or otherwise, it is a very uncomfortable thing to go through. 
typically from doing like really high uh, volume or more distance aerobic work where you've just depleted your glycogen and it seems like you can barely move anymore. Now, with exercise intensity, we're going to see notice guys from going at super low intensity, relying mostly on our plasma fatty acids actually. And then as you see our intensity ramp up, muscle glycogen's contribu contributions go way up, plasma glucose goes up a little bit, and notice the plasma fatty acids actually goes down because we're just not able to take it up at the that fast of a rate relative. Now, I really like this graph over here because it shows you energy cost. Obviously, as we go up higher at this line, it takes more energy to do it. And then the rate of which we're going to be utilizing carbohydrates. And then we can also figure out the rate of which we're going to be using fat. And then notice the bottom part of this line is going to be with blood glucose. So if we were to talk about going for a walk, this line here would be shifted way over. It's, you notice, yeah, your walking speed is not at 10 kilometers per, well, no, no, even if you guys are really legging it out, you're not going to be walking at 10 miles an hour unless you're like a race walker. But then as you're going to move your way up on the speed, we're going to rely more heavily on our muscle glycogen blood glucose. So specifically, if we're going to put this line somewhere for our cross country kids, the line's going to be somewhere more over here between the 22 and 24. So it's just muscle glycogen and blood glucose. Hence why it's so important that you make sure that you get enough glycogen in them. Whereas if you're going to go and do something like hike the AT, which, um, yeah, when we, when the world goes back to normal, I'd like to hear more stories of what it was like in person uh, from you doing it, Kristen, because that sounds very interesting. But that's going to be relying mostly on fat, along with obviously a certain amount of muscle glycogen and blood glucose. So we've also covered this before in XFIS when we talk about the energy stores in your average person of how much glycogen we're going to have stored inside of our livers and our and our muscles. Now, remember, it can be in your legs, but if you're swimming, it's not going to go suddenly to your lats and help you swim through the water and vice versa. So we need to make sure that we're topping off glycogen and specifically making sure we top off glycogen after we get training those muscle groups, because that's when they have a greater sensitivity for carbohydrate. Now, obviously the blood glucose is there also for our nervous system to function like it should. Red blood cells can only use anaerobic glycolysis. But then we obviously have our fat stores that we can run through. Now your nervous system is also fat, so is your bone marrow. You don't want to exactly hemorrhage that, so you can go ahead and you know walk, jog, or crawl, whatever excessive distances. And then we obviously have body protein that we can utilize as an energy source. Now, notice for the average man, which I mean, what's the point of being average? Because there really is no such thing. But this is for a guy that would weigh about 154 pounds and we're going to say um, this isn't a male here, and that's about 15% body fat. So yeah, I don't know of anybody in here that would be your uh, typical, and it's of course, it's European male, because uh, most of the research that they initially did on this stuff was in white guys. So yay, kind of, but it's important more to understand that we've got huge stores. We just can't tap into them that rapidly. And so we need to make sure we're understanding what's going to be the major essential macronutrient we need to focus on in our athlete. So if you're working with an athlete, carbs are their friends. You do need to make sure they're getting in enough of them and that we're supplementing with them appropriately pre, peri, and post-workout in order so they're going to be able to give you the best possible performance. At the same time, we also need to understand that, see this wonderful exercise duration, you can go forever on fat, but the key is that's usually a lower intensity and a longer duration, but that's also what your body's using when you're just at rest. So you don't really need to make a really hard focused effort on using fat as a fuel because that's what your body's doing most of the rest of the day. Now, remember, we have the use of a lot of different types of factors through negative feedback that are going to influence how we're going to utilize different hormones and essentially cytokines to help fuel us. And specifically, what we're going to go ahead and have you guys do is effectively, we're going to give you guys at 624, I'm going to give you guys, let's say five minutes to give us the basics of how each of these hormones work. Okay, so group one has insulin, two, glucagon, Three is going to be 
uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then four is going to have growth hormone. Five is going to have, sorry, cortisol. And then finally, six is going to have IL-6. Lowercase L's and I's look the same, interleukin-6. And you guys are going to go ahead and talk us through effectively how these hormones are going to work. You can, we can just put that up in the chat and how that's going to cause us to use certain macronutrients more than other macronutrients and how that's going to influence our preference for what fuels we're using. Does that make sense to you guys? Taking the silence is a yes. So have fun guys. I'll see you back in about four minutes. All right, guys, whenever you're ready, go ahead and post into the chat what you guys came up with for your signaling uh, and the way that's rolling in the body. So whenever you're ready, just go ahead and post in the chat what you guys came up with. Or you guys can unmute yourself and talk your way through it, whichever you guys are in the mood for. Just for fun, if you maybe notice the difference of the background is now dark, it's because my wife is letting our wonderful dog out into the backyard and she does not want to be on camera because she's ashamed of me, doesn't want to be associated with this. Okay, good. But Lewis, now how is that affecting your hormonal? How's that hormonal production affecting your preference for different macronutrients? That's the big thing we're talking about with growth hormone here. I believe what you have there, it's going to be gluconeogenesis, so it's creating new glucose. Uh, Kristen? Good job. And then IL-6 is, notice it's having you try to use protein more to build up, but it's also going to help you break down a little bit more fat. Uh, just to go ahead and go with uh, the growth hormone group, it's going to cause you to actually break down fatty acids more as a fuel and actually utilize less uh, carbohydrates as a fuel source. In fact, people that abuse a lot of growth hormone have run the risk of effectively developing insulin resistance because it works against an opposition there. Now, insulin uh, trend and the other thing you guys should have focused on there, which is remember, insulin is going to help you preferentially use carbohydrates more as a fuel and fatty acids less as a fuel. And then... Yes. Now, Abby, also with you guys, remember epinephrine and norepinephrine are also going to help you free up fatty acids to utilize them more as a fuel and carbohydrates. And this is a problem specifically when it's very cold outside or you're working in very warm environments because you're actually going to go through your glucose at a higher rate because you're not going to be sending as much blood flow to your adipose. So you're not going to be able to take advantage of the increased fatty acid breakdown you're going to get from the epinephrine and instead you're going to burn through more of your glycogen than you would have otherwise. Nice guys. Nice. So as you suspect over long enough periods of time, the body is going to start to get better at utilizing one fuel over another. And like anything else, if you just eat a high carb diet, do a lot of aerobic work, your ability to break down glucose aerobically is probably going to increase and your storage for whenever you're trying to do anaerobic glycolytic work. Now, the thing that's fascinating with this on top of that is the fact that whenever we're using 
a lot of uh, when some athletes will actually cycle and go through periods of the year where they do a lower carb diet and a higher fat diet, because in theory, it's actually going to increase your body's amount of mitochondria and some of the enzyme related to effectively aerobic metabolism. So that whenever you convert back into the high fat diet or the high carb diet, you have those advantages of increased mitochondria. Now you've got more carbohydrates, so you can utilize them as fuel. So Yay. Going through what we just talked about, but just giving you a nice little table to give you the same information. And so when we're talking about cortisol itself, we're talking about binds to the receptor, because remember, this is going to be a steroid hormone. So it binds inside of the cell, which in turn is going to cause that DNA expression, which is going to change how things function. Whereas epinephrine, insulin growth hormone are all, well, peptide or amino acid based proteins so they're going to signal on the outside and effectively influence cellular signaling to make things effectively go through a signaling cascade. Now, one thing that's also important to understand when we talk about insulin is yes, that's gonna help get carbohydrates into the muscle, but so is exercise and higher levels of intracellular calcium, which occurs obviously when the muscle is contracting. So you don't necessarily need to go ahead and utilize insulin to get more carbohydrates into your muscles. And that's why exercise is typically one of the major modalities utilized when people have things like type 2 diabetes as a means to help obviously improve health. So this is showing you guys the wonderful hormonal relationships with the high carb and low carb diet. In theory, the people with a high carb diet, go figure, can last longer in exercise that requires you to use mostly carbohydrate. And those on the lower carb diet, it's noticed it's more stressful with the higher amounts of epinephrine compared to the other group. But eh, it's just an important thing to understand like anything else. We want to make sure that we're fueling our athletes appropriately for what they're trying to do. The same thing is gonna be said when we're looking at a trained compared to untrained individual where a training session for someone untrained, notice guys, is gonna be far, far more stressful with our stress hormones. Now, uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH is literally the signaling hormone that's going to cause a release of cortisol. So notice their cortisol is going to really increase over those 20 minutes, whereas the trained people didn't even change. But they're also having a much more robust growth hormone response. So it's important to understand that, yes, you're going to not do as well from acute training, but at the same time, you're also going to disrupt homeostasis much harder with someone that is relatively untrained, which is why, you know, obviously they're going to make a lot of changes in a brief period of time initially. And so we have our happy little flow chart of how we're going to have a bunch of notice positive and negative feedback to cause different parts of the system of breaking down from muscle glycogen or from liver glycogen into plasma glucose, which in turn is going to flow through into the citric acid cycle. And from over here, we've got fatty acids either coming from our adipose or inside of our muscles, how that in turn is going to now become activated and go through beta oxidation and then through the citric acid cycle. The key, this is a key slide to understand guys, where you're going to see what are the different things that are giving us negative feedback. So slowing it down, or these are going to be activators. So this is going to be telling those cycles to effectively work at a higher rate. So I know I've introduced this to you guys before, but understanding the basic kind of pyramid here of how we're going to utilize one energy system compared to another. So the highest energy production is always going to be the ATP BCR. But notice it's a very short, very brief period of time that we can maintain this for compared to anaerobic glycolysis, which is going to give us notice way more energy production because notice it's higher up on the pyramid, but it's still, it's bigger than ATP BCR, but it's still relatively small. And then we get bigger as we go down. So we need to think about what is the athlete using during their sport, during their training, and then how are we going to fuel them appropriately so they're going to be able to perform and perform each time. And like anything else, the better an athlete's going to recover, the better they're probably going to perform for you. So any questions over our wonderful metabolism review and effectively how all these things are going to be working together? <laughs>
All right. Well, if there are no questions, we're going to keep moseying on forward and we're going to start talking now about energy demands. So, and effectively how we're going to make that happen. So the picture here is what's known as a bomb calorimeter. And this is literally what food would be placed inside and then effectively exploded. And then the amount of heat that it gives off would be in turn measured. And that's how we figure out literally how many calories are in there, which is the energy required to increase one gram of water, one degree Celsius from 14 to 15 degrees centigrade. Now we eat big C calories, also known as kcals. So thousands of calories. So now we're talking about the energy required to increase one liter of water, one degree Celsius. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can measure this. Uh, first and foremost, we as humans aren't very efficient. Only about 25 to maybe 40% of the energy you break down from food is actually used for work. Most of that energy is just gonna be released as heat. And so we're gonna talk about a lot of different ways that we can measure demands. And this is going to be from th some things that are far more direct, some things that are more indirect. And these are things that we've touched on before and exercise fizz, but we're gonna go ahead and talk a little bit more about it. How we're gonna then meet those demands, how we're gonna have some special situations where people aren't exactly behaving the way that you'd figure in a textbook because they're humans. And a little bit about the energy, which we talked about before. Also, you sometimes see, uh, instead of calories, you'll see it in kilojoules. And you remember that's work from biomechanics, which is force over dis or force times distance. And then obviously how efficient different macronutrients are compared to one another. So like anything else, we need to figure out how much energy is in the food. So hence, blow it up. And the key is, do you actually get in every single calorie that you are eating? And the answer to that is no. A certain amount of that energy is gonna be lost just during the digestion. Certain foods are far less digestible than others. So notice over here, guys, when it comes to protein sources, you're going to see when we look down at legumes, so beans and otherwise, notice that digestibility is markedly lower than when we compare that to obviously animal products. And then when we come to fats, vegetables, notice still a little bit lower digestibility than animal foods. And then finally, when we come to carbohydrate, which is hilarious to think of like an animal food that happens to be a food from coming from an animal that is mostly carbohydrate, I guess liver glycogen, if you want to eat liver of an animal and a little bit of muscle glycogen, but it's not that much that it's going to ever taste sweet. Ooh. Well, I mean, if you had the blood of an animal that was diabetic, but um, you're going to see, notice guys, the digestibility for carbohydrates are overall pretty good, pretty good. Uh, fruits can be naturally a bit lower and that's just because of the fiber content, which is not a bad thing. Just because you're not, you are made up of literally everything you eat, but only the things that you digest. And what, guys, is a straightforward way of figuring out if you did or did not digest the food that you ate? Oh, sorry, Tiz. Sorry, girl. Okay, I just lay down on the floor behind me. What's an easy way for us to figure out if you're actually digesting the food that you ate? This is a good way to... Yes, thank you, Alex. Did you see it a second time in the toilet? If you look down and there's a chicken wing staring back at you, boy, howdy, you need to chew your food better. And at the same time, you know, that's a, that's a really bad sign. And I'm sure you guys have maybe heard someone talk about how you shouldn't eat that much protein because it's wasted. Um, that was a bigger deal when I was growing up more so. Um, and I had to hear that a lot. And the reality is, no, your body's really good at digesting mostly everything you eat. Now, I'm sure all of you guys have seen maybe some corn in there that you didn't chew well enough or some other things in there from time to time. And that's your indicator of like, no, you didn't digest it because it's literally passing out the back end. Now, obviously everything else, because that's not in the same form, you're going to be digesting and effectively breaking down most every bit of it. Now, from there, we want to figure out how much energy we're spending. And this is where we can talk about calorimetry. So putting someone in a room, figuring out how much energy they're giving off into it, or putting them in a suit that does the same thing. Indirect calorimetry, which is going to be like we do with the metabolic heart that we have inside of the lab. And then same thing with essentially breathing into and out of, so we can look at the total breathing volume and look at the total amount of oxygen that's being used and otherwise as an indicator of how much energy. 
Douglas bags, which is going to be pictured on the next slide, was a method of gas collection. So you can then go and measure it. Now we're up to more systems like breath by breath, where you can do it more rapidly. You can also give people doubly labeled water, which is just uh, instead of hydrogen, where it's only a proton, it's hydrogen that also has a neutron. And since it's a little bit heavier, you can actually measure that through your analysis as to how much they're turning over. And then same thing with bicarbonate, along with obviously things like heart rate monitor, accelerometers, and just looking at activity. None of these are perfect. All of them are going to have their issues. Direct calorimetry is obviously going to be much better on average with accuracy and giving us a really good breakdown of how many calories a person really is using. But we're still just trying to get at a good idea of how much they happen to be turning over. In fact, uh, a fascinating guy and Alex, you had to hear about him all in advanced exphys. Uh, one of the first guys to do this was known as Sartorio Sartorio. And he literally measured everything he ate or drank for over 30 years and also measured all of his urine and feces for 30 years along with himself. So he could actually mathematically figure out how many calories his body was going through. I would hate to have been that guy's intern. So that's that Douglas bag we were talking about. Here we have obviously more of the breath by breath analysis and then more recent, and you can notice by the monitor, we're not talking that recent, uh, spirometers, or not spirometers, but this can be more of indirect calorimetry through looking at respiration and effectively oxygen demands and carbon dioxide being given off. And so we then have our four major components of energy expenditure. We have a resting metabolic rate. So this is the calories that are burning just to keep us alive every single day. We then have what's known as the thermic effect of food, also referred to as diet-induced thermogenesis. So literally the energy we need to burn to break down the food that we're ingesting. And protein actually has the highest thermic effect of food followed by, well, carbs if you have a lot of protein and some and fats are relatively close to one another. And then finally we have energy expenditure through exercise. So that's the thermic effect of exercise. So how many calories we burn from what we're doing throughout the day. Now, the fourth one, which we are talking about, which you guys have learned about, and this is how I can tell who listened to the lectures, is what's known as non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Actually, this is another part that people are gonna be burning calories every single day doing, okay? Non-exercise activity thermogenesis is tapping your foot, air drumming when you're bored, just kind of you know dancing in your chair, otherwise fidgeting. And that little bit of fidgeting, if somebody fidgets all day long, can net them a literally an extra 100, maybe even more than 200 calories per day, which doesn't sound like much. But what's really interesting is a couple things that happen here. When people are on a diet, when they're really bringing less calories in, they typically are going to massively decrease their non-exercise activity thermogenesis. They're not going to fidget as much. They're not going to tap their feet as much. They're not going to move around as much. And because of that, they're not going to burn as many calories per day as what they were burning previously. So the deficit they thought they were putting themselves into, well, they actually might be doing a good job calorically of going there, but they're actually still going to be eating enough to maintain their body weight because they're not using that non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And the opposite can be true. When you put people on a really high calorie diet, they might seem like they can't sit still. They're just fidgeting all the time, moving all the time, have all this type of energy. Now, shivering is going to be a reaction you're using to avoiding death because of being in cold circumstances. And I find it fitting that it comes from my wonderful Canadian student. Now, if you're just shivering for no reason all the time, that is something you should probably go to a doctor and figure out what's going on. But yeah, shivering would be a form of non-exercise activity thermogenesis. It's your body just trying to burn calories to increase your core temperature as effectively as a survival mechanism. So, you know, that's completely normal, especially during uh, the wonderful weather that we're having these days. But I wouldn't say that's really a good long-term strategy for losing weight. Um, but that's something. But how many of you guys, you know, are those people that are constantly tapping your feet, constantly fidgeting, have a really hard time sitting still? And then if you put them on a crash diet, like a really low caloric intake, 
They might just lay there inert on the couch and hardly ever move because like anything else, the body's trying to be lazy. It's not trying to burn a single extra calorie to do anything if it can help it. So because of this and these four, which can be working obviously both against our own weight gain goals because we're fidgeting too much or against our weight loss goal because we don't fidget anymore. So we're not actually hitting what we thought were our caloric expectations. So obviously you can get to people that are super high exercise, but most people, the lion's share of calories they burn each day is that resting metabolic rate. And we have here guys, is notice guys, the KCALs per day, these insane numbers. This is actually going to be from Tour de France athletes. And this is where they're going to take an insane amount of calories every single day because notice guys, the caloric demand, close to 9,000 calories of exercise. Now, when you get to the crazy high caloric demands, it's very easy for athletes to under eat it because they're just exhausted and they're not even hungry anymore. So that's something that's very rare to have to deal with but that is quite possibly something that could in fact happen. So um, though in all seriousness, Tori, are you looking at using shivering as a, as a technique for weight loss? No, it's just all, so I, when I pitch, I have bullpens and stuff like that. And that's basically my workout for the day. When I practice me and the other POs have to just stand on the sidelines. Oh, cause you're just butts off out there. Yeah, so we literally always make jokes that we're make, we're burning more calories just standing here shivering than we are doing other exercises during practice because we don't do anything. That's actually accurate. You guys are probably burning a decent uh, above your normal resting metabolic rate when you're really that cold. There's some folks that now I've never done this myself, and if it wasn't a pandemic, I would extend this opportunity to you guys. Um, that there's people that like to tout that you can effectively do ice baths very frequently. And I mean like half an hour a day, every single day as a means to taking advantage of that shivering response to burn more calories for weight loss, which obviously sounds freaking miserable for anyone that's done a decent amount of ice baths. But if somebody's crazy enough to do it, I'm, I'm interested enough to try to suffer with them. Um, obviously we, we stop before anyone hits hypothermia, but you know, now I put this additional slide in there because I think it's an important thing for you guys to understand contextually, which is most of our calories at rest are actually being burned by effectively four different organs, all of which are going to weigh less than five pounds each. So our brain, our liver, our heart, and our kidneys are going to be burning over 50% of your calories for each day. Now, Obviously, muscle is going to be burning a certain amount of calories to maintain itself. It's a, it is a metabolically expensive tissue to keep around, but nowhere near as expensive as your brain, your liver, your heart, and your renal system. Now, obviously, exercise can allow that metabolic requirements for the muscles to skyrocket. And fat is usually like less than a kcal per day. It's really, really cheap per kilogram uh, to keep that effectively operating inside of a normal person. But it's important to understand when we're looking at our resting metabolic rate, just because you've gained five, 10 pounds of muscle, well, if this, if this trended linearly, which it doesn't, it actually is a very rapid diminishing returns. If we put on, because notice this is in kcals per kilogram, if you gained 10 kilograms of muscle, so 22 pounds of muscle, that is, you've had a great three years of training, if you manage to put on that much lean mass, or you've used a lot of substances that rhyme with testosterone, and you're now only going to be burning an extra 130 calories a day from all that muscle mass gain. Now, 130 calories, is that really big servings or a lot of stuff? Norbs, we live in the suburbs, buddy. Our dog, he's too wound up. I wish I could show you guys a video of him walking around on the ice out there. He does not like walking on it. He just like that paw and like, like doesn't like ever want to put his paws fully on the ground. It's, he's a special puppy. So when we have athletes that are obviously trying to gain weight, we want them to be in a caloric surplus. If we want them to lose weight, weight we want them to be in a caloric deficit. Most people, we typically want them to be in caloric balance. We don't really want them to change weight. We want them to be essentially staying where they're at 
and just doing their best to optimize where they are. And obviously, as our exercise intensity creeps up, we in turn are going to be burning more and more calories. And so what we have here, guys, is this is one way that you could effectively ballpark your energy expenditures for activities. We have over here various sports now. Notice we've got it's, it's gendered, so there could be potentially some differences, and it's relative to the weight of the athlete, and then give you an idea of the actual caloric demands. So notice, yeah, the Tour de Drugs, Tour de France, sorry, Tour de France. Um, we're talking about massive, massive caloric demands, even for relatively small guys. Notice they, own, they don't even weigh over a buck 65, but they're still burning over 5,000 calories per day when they happen to be doing all just like if someone was doing the tri a triathlon, like an Ironman, that's just a massive, massive caloric demand because you're doing so much physical exercise in a given period of time. But even when we look at other sports that we potentially don't think of as that high level of caloric demands, but you can still see some energy expenditures that are required from doing things like bodybuilding style training. Uh, I played water polo, so I will be the first to tell you that it is massively calorically demanding to swim around in the water all day. And weightlifting can do the same. Now, there's going to be certain points where we have very, very low energy expenditures. Now, some of this is because that athlete is suppressed due to, unfortunately, some unhealthy behaviors with an energy intake and coaches that are clinically referred to as douchebags that try to push them down in the weight classes they shouldn't be. And as you suspect, that's going to show itself in weight class athletes and also athletes that happen to have a very, a very big incentive of uh, aesthetic pushed upon them. So who do you guys think are going to be likely that you're going to see some really like surprisingly lower caloric needs than they, what they would potentially need? Yeah. Yeah. Potentially uh, female ice skaters. Absolutely. Uh, who else, who else do you think you could maybe see lower, lower caloric needs than what you expect to actually just keep them in a caloric balance? Jockeys potentially, bodybuilders not so much, and especially it depends on if they're if they're uh, using drugs. Gymnasts, uh, female gymnasts can have some major issues with suppression, uh, just like cheerleaders and potentially dancers, because of once again people being shitty to other people about the type of body mass they need to be in, and so then you're going to find opposite the other side of the coin. You're going to have people that have way way bigger caloric demands than what you suspect. And that's gonna be typically the folks that are doing really high volumes of activity along with the folks that naturally have a higher caloric turnover than you expect. So kind of that faster metabolism. You guys probably all have that one friend that seems like they're perpetually eating and they're never gaining weight. And that is a true thing. Just like you probably have the friend that doesn't really overeat, eats healthy, but they're obviously, they're not that small. And that's coming down to things like genetics, The 800 pound gorilla in the corner of the room that people don't like to talk about sometimes, but it is the truth. And so you're going to find athletes that specifically aerobic athletes that have huge training volumes, swimmers, cross country runners, um, decathletes, triathletes, soccer players, basketball players, they're chewing through so many calories because they need to maintain their body mass and they need to actually eat more calorically dense foods. And then obviously you're going to have certain situations where you're going to think about having a bigger deficit or a smaller deficit. The simple fact is, no matter how much anybody ever tries to argue with you, they're wrong. If you are in a caloric surplus, you will gain weight. What type of weight is going to come down to the type of training you're doing, the type of nutrition you're taking in, a couple other factors. If you're in a caloric deficit, you will lose weight. What type of weight you lose, once again, what type of training you're doing, what type of diet are you, take, are you eating, so on and so forth. Now, no one out operates outside of this. Okay, great point. So what you're going to find, Alex, is thanks to genetics, some people are naturally predisposed to carry greater fat mass, carry greater muscle mass, carry greater mass in general. And the antithesis is true. So you guys probably know people that workout, oh, hold on, I took this picture on purpose. I'm going on my phone. So one of my, uh, he's, not, he's not actually a student, but he's a guy that I've talked to 
many times at the rec center. Super nice kid. Um, he's, he's not a kid. He's, he's effing massive. Um, not sure if you guys have ever met uh, Colby from the rec center. Um, he's one of the fire science majors. Really, really nice guy. I've known him the entire time that he's been here. That guy is straight up genetics and he is literally 225 pounds lean and obviously taller than me. I've, I'm 5'10". I've been training my entire life and I've definitely never been his size. That's just genetics. You guys probably know your friend that has abs or is really lean without really trying for it. And so genetics are going to very much so give us some really interesting information as in some of us are going to be, once again, have predispositions for it's easier for them to get lean. It's easier for them to gain muscle. And then obviously your freaks of your freaks, like your best bodybuilders and otherwise, those are the folks that naturally it's a lot easier for them to gain muscle mass and lose fat mass. This is straight up. There's no way around it. Irregardless when you're talking about drug use, because that's why I brought up the picture of Colby. And like I said, he's a great guy. Colby's natural. He's not using any substances to make him look like that. Now there's a number of dudes that I also see at the rec center that have back knee that I can see from across the gym, also don't seem to know how to wear a mask correctly, that aren't even as big as I am. And I'm not that big. And that's once again, genetics. They have to use drugs to still have not that great of a physique because it could also be their training, could be their nutrition. But the simple reality is, is there's going to be differences. It's the reason why, Alex, you're probably always going to have a better tan than I do. It's just the wonderful genetic hands that you were belt, uh, dealt. I come from mostly Irish, German, and Italian genes. So uh, most of those people avoided the sun. So does that kind of answer your question there, Alex? Yeah, we can't change the next, but we can be aware of them. And so you're going to have your athlete that wants to be blank, but the simple reality is if I wanted to be a five foot two Instagram butt model, I'm too tall, too male, and too everything else to ever be that. I don't have that structure. I don't have those genetics. And so if I was going to try to train my entire life to be that, I'm just letting myself down. So instead, now we're getting into body positivity. Now we're getting into making realistic goals and what we're trying to do. Like if your goal is to be, you know, it's like if I wanted to be better than Tori at who reaches the tallest shelf competition, what, what's the point? She's taller than me. She's got longer arms than me. It's not going to happen. So instead, it's kind of do the best with what you can. And the shame that I see, and this is more of me projecting my own things on this, I don't want you guys to, um, to read too much into this is making sure that you get your patient, your subject, your client, your athlete to make peace with what their body is built for. Like if I could trade this, this structure in tomorrow for Colby's, I'd do that stuff in a heartbeat. You know, I mean, that, that, that's not because of all the surgeries I've had. I've just always wanted to be massive. That, that just looks really cool. Now, at the same time, it's like, that's not who I'm built to be. I've got some gifts for things like deadlifting, so I use them and I enjoy it, but I've learned to also enjoy it. Just like all of you guys probably have a certain type of gift for a certain type of physical activity or a certain type of aesthetic or otherwise. The problem is we live in a culture that we could all, we could all say what each, what a male is supposed to look like and what a female is supposed to look like. And you know that's just a good way to make people feel really shitty about themselves. And instead it's like, yeah, I've, I've worked with female athletes that are built like me. They're meant to be objects that run through walls, not objects that stand, not that are trying to be, you know, figure models. Like that's not the build they have, but that's the social pressure they're under. And that's the entire other effect of, you know, kind of box, uh, Pandora's box. You don't necessarily want to open but you just want to help people slowly become realistic and at the same time positive about the things that they have. Does, does that make sense as I've kind of gone off on a bit of a, an aside here? Yeah. Yeah, the worst is your sport, Tori. The amount of girls that I've met that could have an upper back like mine easily, but they're like, I don't want to be big. I'm like, just try to be big. You'd be able to freaking wreck shop. 
but I think you know exactly who I'm talking about whenever I say you've got some teammates that could be that they just don't want to. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, we don't, we don't need to name names. I am recording this. And so, you know, this is another, uh, Tori is a, a softball player here at EKU. And so unfortunately, well, think about it, guys. We culturally, being a big muscular man is something that is held in higher regards. And if you're a big muscular woman, you're looked at seemingly more as a sideshow and denigrated for, which is too bad because being awesome is awesome. I, you know, being in whatever size you are, like, cool. Like the key is just be happy and proud of your physicality. And it's too bad that people try to make other people feel crummy about the fact that they're built to do this one thing or the other. So anyways, I'm going to hop off that soapbox. This is a good table for you guys, because notice we're getting the total caloric demands relative to the size of the individual. Now, this is obviously across a wider swath. But the nice thing about this, guys, is you can still try to kind of ballpark your weight and then figure, obviously, those of us that are over 198 or less than 110, you can kind of figure you're going to have that linear relationship because the bigger you are, the more energy you're going to use given that activity. Now, this is just kind of ballpark it for you. Like you could maybe go out there and just freaking tear it up with ballroom dancing and be burning way more calories per minute. Notice that's going to be in the parentheses than someone who's doing beginner aerobics. Just like obviously you could be doing circuit training that's a higher rate or even at a lower rate depending on what you're doing, but it's just something you guys can kind of use as a jump off point. And so then, and this is where the sport of softball is a big component because if you're a pitcher or a catcher, you've got a much greater caloric demand when you're playing the sport because you're involved in every single play. Whereas if you happen to be a um, outfielder, you might play an entire game without a single ball ever being hit anywhere near you. So you don't really ever get in those extra yardage. Meanwhile, you could have one game where it seems like your pitcher was just throwing batting practice and you're having to run out to the fence or all over all the time because it seems like there's a magnet in your side of the field. So this is once again, just giving you an idea. So John, there's your volleyball, bud. So how long were you playing volleyball for? So that's going to be the per minute. And then multiplying it by the bracket is going to help you effectively ballpark it. And then same thing, uh, Haley, when we were talking earlier about your playing of basketball. And so effectively, how many calories would you probably have played? So you guys should be able to see these slides. I imagine today for a lot of you guys has probably been more sedentary because, well, let's face it, it's rough outside, but I want you guys now to go through and look at these slides where you can just obviously use the tables in your book. And I want you guys to try to ballpark how many calories you would have, or you probably burned over your, hmm, let's say all of the working out you did on one of the earlier days this week. So you could be like, I lifted weights for half an hour. I played pickup basketball for 45 minutes. Given I weigh this much, I probably burned this many calories during my exercise, okay? So we're gonna go ahead and give everybody, it's 7.08 now, just as individuals. I want you guys to go ahead and effectively, uh, yeah, well, and then effectively put up in the chat what is the activity or what is your total caloric demand you thought you had just from exercise? Okay, and I don't expect perfection. Just do your best and we'll see what you come up with. So give it some go. Uh, 708, I'm just gonna mute myself and pause the video and let you guys kind of work alone, but I will still be looking at the chat. So if you have questions, just put them up there. Otherwise, we're just gonna work independently until about 7.15.
All right, guys, still keep working on your wonderful data and how you guys are going to, you know, ballpark your total caloric demands from the exercise and doing your best. And then I got a question from one of you guys, which is, you know, heart rate and substrate utilization. Usually the higher heart rate, the more you're utilizing carbohydrates as a fuel source. The problem with that is the fact that your heart rate is going to go up because of stress on the body. So uh, for me, my heart rate was elevated the other night because I got my second dose of the COVID vaccination and it put me on my butt all of yesterday. I will be completely transparent. I started feeling rough Tuesday night. I got it on Tuesday. Then of course I worked out because I'm so smart. And, um, but that's completely normal when your body's mounting and obviously an immune response and it's trying to build a lot of antibodies. So we all good. That's okay. And so the heart rate is going to be at least an indicator of how many calories you're going to use, but it also can be an indicator of how stressed you are. So like your calories are going to be up because, or your heart rate is going to be up because you're stressed about work, because somebody's yelled at you, because a car honked at you, because, um, you know, anything like that occurs to you. It's not always going to be the best indicator of how much calories you're consuming when you're exercising, and especially over time when you're exercising, when your heart rate is going lower given a consistent work output, that's usually a great indicator that you're in better shape. If your heart rate is ever going up when you're doing the same uh, level of output, that's usually a pretty good indicator that you're under recovered and that this is now more stressful in your body than it needs to be. So whenever you guys are ready, start posting in how many calories that you guys were chewing through. Nice, Kristen. That's a pretty darn busy Monday. What all did you do? Nice. Same thing, Haley. Those both look realistic. All right. So notice we go back here to uh, that's going to typically be they probably consider that to be more uh, circuit training. If you're going to say over here, man, Tori, way to get after it. Um, and then otherwise, you know, I mean, good Lord, if you're going to burn that many calories table playing table tennis, you can at least assume you're going to burn more than that playing uh, or lifting weights, at least if you're getting after it. Good. Still waiting on a lot of you guys. Whenever you're ready, go and post in there what you guys came up with. Nice, Abby. That looks pretty realistic. Yeah, Trenton, that looks pretty realistic if you played basketball for probably, you know, at least half an hour. Well, I'm going to assume since we got a lot of silence from coming from anybody else. Yeah, that looks pretty realistic, Lewis. Yeah. Nathan and Brent, that looks realistic. 
Good. Like if somebody said they burnt over a thousand calories from exercise, like, okay, like that means that person was getting after it for at least an hour or, or the, yeah, for well over an hour with something. Nice. So now the last part we're going to do is have you guys practice again on doing some calorie counts along with we're going to look at macronutrients and the total cost these diets would be per, per day. Now, have any of you folks heard of J.M. Blakely before? Have any of you guys heard of J.M. Blakely before? So J.M. Blakely was a really, really good bench presser in the uh, 90s, early thousands from Westside Barbell, where that's one of the gyms that he competed out of. Now, he was a, he was a raw bench presser of over 600 pounds uh, before bench shirts were really a thing. Obviously, you've got uh, Julius Maddox now who's knocking on the door for 800, which is, there. it's all crazy numbers to me. Now, J.M. Blakely literally in one year competed all the way down as a 198 up to a 308. So he managed to literally gain and lose 100 pounds, which is not something I would suggest any human being would ever do. And one of his methods, whenever he would try to gain weight, and this would typically be only for a month, and it was insane, is the diet as follows on the slide, which is breakfast is four breakfast sandwiches from a fast food restaurant with a hash brown in between essentially the bun along with a full packet of mayo inside of each. You gotta do at least four of them. Then for lunch, you have to eat for a full hour at a Chinese buffet. And if you vomit, the hour starts over again. For dinner, you have to eat an entire large pizza with every topping on it you can get and you pour an extra one cup of oil, any type of oil, outside of castor oil on top of it. And you look at that pizza, like that pizza is your enemy. That pizza is between you and your goals. And if you don't finish that pizza, you'll never gain the weight that you were looking for. Along with throughout the day, you need to eat chocolate bars. So that way you constantly keep your insulin levels up. So that way you're going to be restoring your glycogen and replenishing your food stores, which is not an issue when you're in this massive of a caloric surplus. So Group one is going to be breaking down the J.M. Blakely diet. So you guys can pick your fast food restaurants for breakfast. You can ballpark what would be a really, really good round at a Chinese buffet. And you better go hard in the paint there, guys. And then obviously, same thing, a large pizza from whatever place that you find uh, interesting, along with obviously all the toppings on it. And then what, how many calories are in a full cup of oil you put on it, along with the candy bars. Now, Dan John, who is a ex Highland Games competitor and thrower, and that's the guy pictured on the right, that's, that's Jim Blakely when he was in one of his heavyweight phases. And this is uh, Dan John. Dan John has this diet, which he says for somebody that can't, that wants to lose weight, but wants to eat anything they want. He's like, that's fine. You can eat anything you want any day after you eat at least two pounds of raw broccoli, one pound of Granny Smith apples, a pound of wild salmon, two pounds of celery, one pound of romaine lettuce, one pound of peppers, green, yellow, red, your choice. One drink a full gallon of water, a full pound of kale, and one pound of butternut squash. After that, you can eat anything you want. And so the basic idea with his diet is you would have spent so much time and energy eating all of these other foods, you never would have had time to eat anything else. And it's kind of an ingenious approach in my mind, but it's definitely something you don't see a lot of people doing. Then we're going to have two other options and one of which is gonna be the vertical diet. This is gonna be popularized by uh, Stan Efferding and it's been used by uh, Bjorn, uh, Hapor Bjornsson and a couple other high profile uh, strongman bodybuilders as a way to prepare. And so effectively the diet each day is gonna be four whole eggs, five tablespoons of grass-fed butter, three pounds of beef, 10 cups of right, uh, white rice, two carrots, one citrus fruit of choice, a sweet potato and four ounces of cranberry juice because we got to keep healthy. And effectively, what's the cost, the calories, macros, we're getting through all these. And then finally, this is the most insane diet I've ever seen. The basic idea with a vertical diet is you get in all of your vitamins and minerals through a couple select choices, hence why you see the carrot, cranberry juice, and... Um, the citrus being thrown in there, and then everything else is effectively from eating more and the eggs 
from eating more red meat and, and white rice because of the ease of digestion. And this is something you would use in massive land mammals that are chewing through a lot of calories because rice is easily digestible and steak just as awesome. I don't know who doesn't like it, but that's the basic idea behind his thoughts, which, you know, there's pros and cons, but this is very much so a, a fad that a number of people are following. And then on the other side of that spectrum is the uh, moon juice lady, which it is wild. I put the leak up there and I'm going to, did I put the link already in the chat? Uh, no, it is all, oh, my buttons aren't toys, Mike. Sorry, I need to copy that over because her diet is probably the, one of the most insanely expensive things I've ever seen. And the group that has to break down this, no offense, I don't have high expectations of you guys getting everything right because it is root loops. You guys should all follow the link and just try to read a little bit of it on your own time. But once you guys, once again, we got the top there. Total calories of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and carbs, and the total cost this diet would be per day. Ballpark it to the best of your ability. I do not expect perfection. It's 728 now. I'm going to give you guys until 740 in your groups. So actually, let me just do this in general. In your groups, really try to separate who's in charge of what guys and make sure you're keeping track of these totals so that you guys are going to be able to go ahead and post this all in. So that way you guys can also copy this right now because we're going to randomize again into uh, breakout rooms only. Obviously, we're just going to do four of them. So that way each group is going to have at least uh, three people in it. So you guys can be able to spread the work around a little bit. So questions, comments, concerns before we kick you guys over there. All right. Well then, let's go ahead, get you guys out there, have fun. I will see you guys in a little bit. Guys, and post into the chat what you guys came up with for each of your diets. And we'll go ahead and briefly go ahead and talk through them. My uh, Jam Blakely group, it's okay if you guys were struggling and not able to get through everything, just give us what you got and we'll kind of talk our way through it. So, yeah, Brent's group did a great job of like, it was an insane different types of uh, nutrients that are incredibly hard to see. And yes, the diet itself is like insane for the expense between the different uh, nutrients and otherwise. And notice the caloric yield was hardly anything. Now, Abby's group did a great job when they were breaking down the basics of Dan Johnson. The idea is you could eat anything you want after that. So yeah, you're going to be still spending at least 20 odd dollars a day. So we're talking about, you're looking at, you know, $154 a week. So that's still a pretty expensive uh, grocery bill. And that's if they decide to eat anything else on top of that. So, you know, it's a potential thing, but it's still a lot. Now, Kristen's diet, they did, or Kristen breaking down the vertical diet the way we had, definitely notice guys, a whole lot of carbs, solid amount of protein and fat. And uh, yes, and it looks like you guys did the math wrong on your calorie total. Same thing I think happened a little bit with Abby's and that's okay guys, because remember it's four grams or four kcals per gram when it comes to both carbs and protein. And then for fat, it's gonna be nine, but like anything else still $40 a day in this example, mind you, is pretty expensive. But if that's your goal is to get swole, I guess you gotta be willing to, spend the money to do it. And then whenever you're ready, um, the Alex's, okay, sweet. <laughs> All right, Katie, that looks pretty accurate for breaking down that diet because it is straight up Fruit Loops. And yeah, depending on what type of Chinese buffet you go to, you could maybe save some money. And if you did like your pizza at Little Caesars, you could probably save a little bit more. But man, if you're trying to be on the gains train, that hard, you're gonna have a hard time 
um, yeah, paying that uh, piper every single day. Now, what did, uh, for the GM Blakely diet group, what did you guys go with for the breakfast choices and everything else? So for the breakfast choices, I think we chose Wendy's. <clears throat> for the buffet, we, uh, we kind of just estimated how much it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we kind of said like, if you're there for an hour, we would say it's like five plates and like, we have somebody in the like one plate's like a thousand calories. Um, and then the pizza, I'm not sure where exactly we got it from. And then the, the, the candy bar was just a uh, Hershey's chocolate bar. Oh, nice pizza Hut for the pizza. Nice, Nathan. I saw that addition there. So yeah, these are, uh, if any of you guys want to try that on your own for a day, I highly suggest not doing it, but if you do it, I'd like to hear about it because I'd be very interested. I know one person here is potentially trying to put on some weight. So if you really want to go about as dirty of dirty bulking as you get, you can feel free to go for broke there, Alex. I won't judge you. Uh, nice. Going with a bacon egg or another solid choice, guys. Good job. Now, obviously we've covered a lot this evening. We've gone through energy production, energy stores, and obviously importance there, and then how we're going to be measuring metabolic needs. And <laughs> yeah, uh, and how we're going to go ahead and match them. And then a little bit on different dietary approaches, but the big principle of caloric balance, why we care about it, and how that's going to influence a lot of our choices. Do you guys have any questions left for me? Otherwise, we're good and we're going to call it a night. Um, it's up to you guys. Questions, comments, concerns, anything else you'd like me to talk about? And how I um, am obviously not endorsing the uh, Moon Juice branding. Okay. Sounds good. So, oh, yeah, if any of you guys want to, I will coach you write your diets for you for a small fee of only $710 a day. I will, I got your backs for that guys. That sounds like a great paying gig. So yeah, if you guys don't have anything else that you guys want to touch on tonight, you guys stay safe out there, especially with the wonderful weather we have. I will see you guys next week. And remember we're going to review at the end of the lecture. So please think about questions as we're going through, make sure we're looking at our text, make sure we're staying on top of our quizzes and our homeworks. And otherwise I will see you guys then. So uh, have a nice night, stay safe, and bye-bye.